Political scientist and communication theorist Dr. Bruce Lanz Smith defined propaganda as a form of communication that is primarily used to influence or persuade an audience to further an agenda. Propaganda is effective in its selective presentation of facts to encourage a particular synthesis or perception, using loaded language to produce an emotional rather than a rational response to the information that is being presented. When we think of the term propaganda, we tend to associate it with its more overt and explicit manifestations. We often think of Nazi-era cartoons, films and imagery where the state is depicted as being ludicrously powerful and almost divinely righteous, with any resistance against their overwhelming supremacy being utterly futile. In stark contrast, the perceived enemy is portrayed as comically evil, with features typically considered unattractive. Famed Nazi productions such as Leni Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will is a great example of this. Its narrative is obsessed with the unstoppable might of the party, and the need for that unstoppable might to be levied against the paradoxically weak and degenerate enemies of the state that somehow secretly control everything. Of course, contrary to popular belief, Triumph des Villains was not a groundbreaking cinematic achievement. Dan Olson from Folding Ideas has already done a great analysis of it from a filmmaking perspective. What made the film so awe-inspiring were not the cinematic techniques per se, which were certainly not novel by 1935, but more so the sheer scope and size of each shot and the amount of money invested into them. Every scene would drag on far longer than it needed to, going that extra mile to showcase the overwhelming power of the Third Reich and the amazement of the German people when in the vicinity of their Führer and his party. What may at first appear to be a filmmaking flaw is in fact propagandistically by design, the purpose of propaganda being not to rationally convince its audience, but to persuade them via the consistent regurgitation of a particular idea. In this case, the divine and cult-like status of the Nazi party and its supreme leader. What's most fascinating about Triumph of the Will and other propagandist media are the contradictions within their narrative that they are so desperately trying to overcome. The film was released merely a year following the infamous Night of the Long Knives, where the Nazi party conducted a series of extrajudicial executions intended to consolidate power and effectively eliminate Ernst Röhm and the Sturmabteilung, the Nazi's paramilitary organisation, as a political threat. Thus, throughout the film, what the audience is mostly seeing is not the unified, highly trained standing army of Germany marching across the country, but a mishmash of soldiers from the various Nazi-affiliated paramilitary organisations only recently subordinated to the will of the regime. This is important because a government engaging in fascism, characterised by ultranationalism, dictatorial power and suppression of opposition, will often try to present the facade of stability, tradition and unity with their political allies and the country as a whole. In reality, there are often major divisions within fascist political parties, or between them and the organisations and people that they are attempting to co-opt for their agenda. For example, the Standing Army of Germany was at this stage not entirely on board with Hitler's seizure of absolute power following the death of President Hindenburg. They were not yet the Wehrmacht of World War II, that's why they only compose a minority of military forces seen throughout the film. Therefore, it could be argued that the effectiveness of propaganda lies just as much in what is not shown to the audience, rather than merely what is shown. For instance, in our recent documentary on Israel and Palestine, we discussed how Israeli, American and Indian media outlets will be very quick to implicate the Palestinians for throwing rocks at armoured police forces for example, whilst dismissing the organised raids conducted against Palestinian homes along with spontaneous property evictions, indefinite detentions without trial, killing, immobilising and tear gassing of protesters, medics and journalists, as well as countless airstrikes against infrastructure, schools and hospitals. The point here is that when it comes to recognising and criticising propaganda, it is vital to ascertain what is not being said as well as identifying what is being said. It is very easy to selectively portray a particular narrative of historical or contemporary events 
whilst avoiding any details which may contradict it. This, I believe, comfortably brings us on to the topic of today's video. In March 2022, Z Studios released The Kashmir Files, a film presenting a fictional storyline centred around the tragic exodus of Hindus from the Indian-administered region of Jammu and Kashmir in early 1990. The film was a major commercial success, rapidly becoming the highest grossing Hindi production of the year so far. India's ruling Bharatiya Janata Party affirmed their explicit endorsement of the movie, declaring it tax-free in 10 BJP-governed states across the country. The provinces of Assam and Madhya Pradesh going as far as to grant vacations to government employees and police personnel who planned to watch the film. Even the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi attacked critics in response to negative reviews, asserting that they were engaged in a sort of conspiratorial ecosystem to discredit the film, which supposedly reveals a hidden truth and presents Kashmir's history within the quote-unquote correct perspective. At the screenings of the film, Hindutva activists raised slogans advocating for fatal violence against Kashmiri Muslims and Indian Muslims in general, with calls being made to prevent Hindu women in particular from converting to Islam and threatening reprisals against perceived traitors to the nation. The film's director Vivek Agnihotri reacted to the calls to violence with nonchalance in an interview with the French press, adding that so long as the far-right activists aren't directly hurting anybody, their comments are just fine. The two questions that we're going to explore in this video today are why does India's ruling party have such a vested interest in the promotion of this film? And how accurate is the film's portrayal of the events depicted therein? To answer these two questions, we must first explore the historical context surrounding the events leading up to and coterminous with the exodus of Kashmiri Hindu Pandits. We will then analyse the framing of these events throughout the film itself, and finally, what the Indian government and its state-aligned media have to gain from maximising the exposure of the Kashmir files across the country and abroad. According to historian Chitraleka Zuchi, in the late 1940s, most Muslims in Jammu and the Kashmir Valley were still debating the value of the state's association with India or Pakistan. By the 1950s, the Indian government's seeming determination to settle Kashmir's accession to India without a reference to the people of the state brought Kashmiri Muslims to extol the virtues of independence, as well as condemn India's high-handedness in its occupation of the territory. And even those who had been in favour of India to begin with began to speak in terms of the state's association with Pakistan, despite the invasion less than a decade earlier. As discussed by Dr. Yoginder Sekhand, these patterns would continue into the 1980s. Increasing anti-Indian protests took place in Kashmir throughout this decade. The Mujahideen resistance to the USSR in Afghanistan and revolution in Iran were becoming sources of inspiration for large numbers of Kashmiri Muslim youth disenfranchised by their lack of civil rights under Indian occupation. The state authorities responded with increasing use of brute force to simple economic demands. Both the secular pro-independence Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front, or JKLF for short, and the pro-Pakistan Islamist groups including the Jamaat Islami Jammu Kashmir mobilised the fast-growing anti-Indian sentiments among the Kashmiri population. Dr. Sikhan further elaborates that even as late as 1986, Jamaat member Syed Ali Shah Gilani, who later became a supporter of Kashmir's armed revolt, was urging that the solution for the Kashmir issue be resolved through peaceful and democratic means. To achieve its goal of self-determination for the people of Jammu and Kashmir, the Jamaat-e-Islami's stated position was that the Kashmir issue be solved through constitutional means and dialogue. However, this would all soon change. The communal violence and clashes between Hindus and Muslims escalated following the removal of restrictions on India's Uttar Pradesh Babri Masjid in 1986, allowing one of the most historically significant mosques in the subcontinent to function as a Hindu temple. Simultaneous to this was the construction of a mosque within the premises of an ancient Hindu temple in Jammu, as a place for civil workers to conduct their daily prayers. The increased clashes that emerged culminated in the 1986 Anantanag riots, which saw multiple attacks on Kashmiri Hindu-owned shops, 
homes and temples. It should be noted here that the violence between Hindus and Muslims in Kashmir did not emerge as a result of the conversion of the Babri Masjid or the construction of a mosque on the grounds of an ancient Jammu Hindu temple, nor did it emerge as a result of some deeply rooted enmity between the Muslim and Hindu communities. Rather, these events were the catalysts which facilitated the tensions that already existed between the pluralistic society of Kashmir. Tensions which existed primarily due to the Indian government's unwillingness to rule the region in a democratic manner, and consistent desire to vilify the Kashmiri people as violent and unsuitable to be treated with dignity, especially its majority Muslim population. An example of this phenomenon would be during the earlier 1983 assembly elections, where Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi campaigned by fear-mongering about a so-called Muslim invasion in the Jammu region because of the recent resettlement bill, which gave Kashmiri refugees who fled for Pakistan between 1947 and 1954 the right to return, reclaim their properties and resettle. Indian nationalist organisations such as the RSS and their affiliated subdivisions demanded stricter governmental control. This was of course in spite of Kashmiri Muslim requests for greater autonomy and self-determination, and thus merely cemented the political polarisation of the Kashmiri people along religious lines. Finally, this state-contrived political polarisation eventually manifested itself in the infamously rigged elections of 1987. The erosion of autonomy and increased corruption had forced the National Conference, once led by Sheikh Mohammed Abdullah, to come to a joint accord with the National Congress, both factions fearing the growing political popularity of the more Islamist-leaning parties in the region. In turn, the Islamic Kashmiri political organisations unified into a polyglot coalition of their own, known as the Muslim United Front. A senior member of the Indian Congress party at the time, Khemlata Wahlu, recalls, I remember that there was a massive rigging in the 1987 elections. The losing candidates were declared winners, and it shook the ordinary people's faith in the elections and the democratic process. The degree to which malpractices affected the overall outcome of the election is unclear, with some scholars and senior journalists such as political scientist Sumantra Bose and Bernard de Mello opining that the Muslim United Front would have won most constituencies across the Kashmir Valley and likely inflicted an electoral defeat on the Conference Congress Combine had the elections not been rigged. But on a practical level, this did not matter. The rigging of the 1987 election was the last nail that the Indian political establishment had hammered into the coffin of liberal democracy in Kashmir. As far as Kashmiris could see, this had all but confirmed that their right to national self-determination would not be afforded to them via a democratic political process. And for many, this revealed an unfortunate reality that the only way forward was armed insurrection. The Indian government had, in effect, single-handedly rang the death knell for a peaceful democratic solution to the Kashmir conflict. And this brings us on to the present insurgency beginning in 1989, within which the Kashmir files are set. The decision by the creators to title this film as The Kashmir Files was a deliberate one, made to indicate a degree of investigative journalism throughout. As we shall explore, the important and operative word here is not Kashmir, but files. Files implies something that was previously secretive and suppressed, now coming to light. The journalistic tinge is important. It is not merely a film, but it is a fact-finding mission in which the audience is now a part of. This is reinforced by the disclaimer at the start of the film which states that each event is corroborated by historical sources and testimonies. Given that this is how the director and writers of the film wish the audience to view it, then this is also the fair standard to which I will hold it accountable. The film story about the genocide of Kashmiri pandits is told through the lens of our young protagonist, a pandit student known as Krishna, whose mother, father and older brother were murdered during the insurgency of 1989 to 1990. He is raised by his grandfather, Pushkar, 
who has shielded his grandson from the truth of what happened to his family during those fateful months. As the film progresses, we are introduced to a cast of other characters. A civil servant called Brahma Dutt, a journalist called Vishnu, Dr. Mahesh, and Officer Hari Narain, who were all close friends with Krishna's family before they were killed. Now, an observation that one may come away with whilst watching this film is that most of the people within it are not actually characters in the strictest sense. Rather, they are archetypes made to fit within the film's narrative. Brahma was a civil servant who tried to rescue pandits but failed. Officer Hari was a civil servant who tried to rescue pandits but failed. Mahesh was a doctor who tried to rescue pandits but failed. This is all we ever know or learn about who they are as people. None of our characters, aside from Krishna and his grandfather Pushkar, ever undergo any major changes or arcs throughout the film. So throughout the extended scenes of dialogue between Krishna and the friends of his family, we learn very little about who these people actually are beyond those basic facts. Rather, the conversations that they have are exclusively composed of commentary on Indian and Kashmiri politics. And they all, except Krishna, pretty much say the exact same things as one another in every scene. They are cardboard cutouts that exist only to lecture the audience on what the film wants them to believe. The conversations are less dialogue where people exchange different ideas giving us insight into their personalities, and more like a family group chat where they each take turns monotonously commenting on the same thing. Whether it's the past or the present, whether they are smiling or frowning, their conversations exist only to advance the film's thesis. The reduction of every character to a single moldable archetype that the writers can carve into whatever is required for the film's narrative best manifests itself within our main protagonist, Krishna. Despite Krishna being a Hindu pandit student who grew up in various refugee camps, he knows next to nothing about his own history and culture. The fact that he had a family who were killed during the insurgency and thus spent his entire childhood surrounded by a displaced and uprooted community has absolutely nothing to do with who he is as a person. His own grandfather, who despite consistently wearing his heart on his sleeve and never shying away from the truth, refuses to tell Krishna anything about his family. Krishna's pandit identity is essentially irrelevant to his character throughout the duration of the film. The writers set up this inconsistency whereby Krishna has grown up amongst pandit refugees including his own candid and impassioned grandfather, yet presents him as a tabula rasa, a blank slate. A boy who somehow knows nothing about his history and family. This contradiction is not a mistake. This contradiction exists because Krishna is not supposed to represent a Kashmiri pandit. Rather, his role is to serve as a template for the ignorant young Indian Hindu men, people who, much like Krishna, have been brainwashed by intellectuals, institutions, and foreign media. People who don't know their own country, who must be rescued, nurtured, and educated to spread the message further. And as we shall explore, this is the arc that he undergoes throughout the film. So the reason why our main cast all have such basic characterization is not because the writers are incompetent, I mean, they might be, but rather it is because this film is not actually about Kashmiri pandits. Rather, it is an extended commentary on the political affairs of Kashmir, as well as how its history is presented, recorded, and acted upon by the Indian government, its educational institutions, and journalistic media outlets. As we shall explore, the film simply weaponizes the exodus or genocide of Kashmiri pandits as a mechanism to achieving this aim. Every time the film gets close to giving its pandit characters a degree of personality outside of the set bounds of its political narrative, it immediately re-diverts the script to revolve around its political commentary. This negation of Kashmiri pandit identity throughout the film stems beyond the characters themselves. The movie wants to claim Kashmiri pandits as Indian Hindus and not as Kashmiri pandits. A character even says at one point that these were not Kashmiri pandits who suffered, but Indians. It projects a certain Hindu idea of India, and an Indian Hindu idea of Kashmiri pandits, even to the extent of showing only vegetarian food in Kashmiri pandit cuisine. 
Yet, as noted by Kashmiri Pandit novelist and economist Dr. Natasha Cole, Kashmiri Pandits grew up eating not just vegetarian dishes such as Dom Olav, Nadru and Chaman, but also meat dishes like Lenny Rogan Josh. The interesting culinary selection during the film was not a mistake. After all, director Agnihotri himself has a history of condescendingly attempting to impose Indian Hindu vegetarian culinary tastes over their more mixed Kashmiri counterparts. This imposition and weakening of Pandit identity are reflected within the film, whereby Kashmiri Pandits are made to dilute their political, cultural and culinary tastes to suit conservative Indian sensibilities. The non-Pandit characters fare little better. One of our antagonists, Professor Radhika Menon, is a scheming, manipulative and agenda-driven lecturer at ANU University. Her eyes are lined with dark kajal, she wears silver jewellery, dark lipstick and is shot in very tight close-ups. The camera focuses on her big shining eyes and ashen moving lips as her face comically flickers in the limelight. After she is dismembered and dehumanised by the camera, whatever she says can be easily dismissed or trivialised. Every word that emanates from her is said with the most conspiratorial air and as we shall explore, this applies even to the things she says that are factually correct. Interestingly enough, there is one other archetype in this film. The Muslim. In this film, the Muslim is depicted as marching and marching and marching and marching and chanting and chanting and chanting and chanting. Then he marches some more and chants some more and these scenes drag on and on and on and they come up again and again and again. Every single Muslim in this film without exception is depicted as such. Every Muslim man, every woman and every child. The Muslim is nothing else. The film quite literally does not allow him to be anything else. Despite just how frequently the Muslim appears on screen, the only named Muslim person in this film is our main antagonist, Farooq Malik Bitta. Every single Muslim in this film is Farooq Malik Bitta, and Bitta is every Muslim in this film. Every Muslim is portrayed as a genocidal bigot that wants to rape Hindu women and murder Hindu men and children. Every single Muslim is either a terrorist or a terrorist sympathizer. And every single terrorist or terrorist sympathizer is a Muslim. There are no exceptions to this. There can be no exceptions to this. Because as we shall see, if the film provided allowances to this rule, then it would fundamentally violate its own thesis. One of the hallmarks of fascism and fascist propaganda is the depiction of the perceived ethnic or religious enemy as sharing collective guilt for the crimes of a few. Throughout the Kashmir Files, director Agnihotri takes steps to ensure that the audience is well aware that the murder of innocent Kashmiri pandits was not merely a crime committed by a few select insurgency groups, but rather something that the Muslim population of Kashmir as a whole was responsible for. For example, during the opening act where Krishna's father Karan is murdered by Farooq Malik Bitta for being a suspected Indian spy, the director consciously ensures that Karan's Muslim neighbour is revealed to be a terrorist sympathiser and close friend of Bitta who informs the militants of where Karan is hiding. In the preceding scene, the unnamed Muslim neighbour is respectfully called brother by Karan during their conversation whilst his son Abdul is shown playing cricket with Krishna's elder brother Shiva. One moment, ordinary Kashmiri Muslims are suggested to be cherished friends of the Pandits, and the next moment this suggestion is soundly refuted, as they are depicted signing the death warrants of their own Hindu neighbours. This scene is not an isolated incident. During our climax towards the end of the film, the audience witnesses the tragic Nadimag massacre, where 24 innocent Kashmiri pandits were gunned down by Lashkar-e-Taiba militants disguised as Indian army personnel. 
The film depicts this event by having the militants enter the village in broad daylight. After receiving approval from a local Mulvey, the camera takes its time, slowly panning over the faces of the 24 pandits as they are each individually shot, one at a time, at point-blank range, straight into an open grave in full view of their surrounding Muslim neighbours. There is one slight problem with this. No local or government source corroborates this account. According to the actual residents of Nadimag, the killings took place at night, when most of the village was indoors. Since the attackers wore uniforms, it was taken to be a search operation. Residents say the guns had silences and they did not know of or see the massacre until afterwards, when they heard the cries of anguish. Pandits, including women and children, were lined up near a stream and shot at night. Sanjay Tiku, the head of the Kashmiri pandit Sangharsh Samiti, even stated in an interview with Al Jazeera, that was not like that. No massacre of Kashmiri pandits took place before the eyes of Kashmiri Muslims. Director Agnihotri once again consciously rewrites a crime as having taken place under the watchful eye of ordinary Kashmiri Muslims, in order to reinforce the idea that they as a collective monolithic group were responsible for the events that we see throughout the film. Now, the director could have shown Kashmiri pandit houses quietly crumbling away in Nadimag, and Kashmiri Muslims still grieving for neighbours who will never return. But in Agnihotri's universe, any expression of grief, any gesture of friendship is a lie meant to cover up the sins of the past. To portray Muslims as having the capacity for genuine friendship with their pandit neighbours would, as previously mentioned, fundamentally contradict the film's thesis. That being the idea that all Muslims were collectively guilty of the crimes against pandits. The Nadimag massacre is also not the only real-life event that the film purposefully misrepresents. In one scene, famed Indian Air Force squadron leader Ravi Khanna is depicted as being killed by Bitta in a drive-by shooting just after handing toffee to a child. Khanna's wife, Nirmala, actually issued a court petition that the scene be cut due to its blatant inaccuracies. As she noted, Khanna was actually shot whilst on his way to the office. No schools were open, as there was a state-enforced curfew at the time. The film consciously changes these events to depict Bitta murdering Khanna in front of children, not just for the sake of sensationalising the event, but also because to show an Indian-backed curfew would contradict the narrative that the film is attempting to push. This narrative being that the military played little to no role in the conflict, and that this was purely a case of insurgents instigating terror attacks and single-handedly ruining the day-to-day -day lives of ordinary Kashmiris. The presentation of Muslims as collectively sharing negative characteristics does not stop at portraying them as violent extremists. The women in this movie are represented, as women typically are by Indian nationalists, as victims of atrocities who suffer barbarism at the hands of Muslims. Women are consistently portrayed as hapless victims and objects of honour, as opposed to people with agency. Rather than shedding light on individual female victims of the violence in Kashmir, the film instead takes advantage of our hazy memory of these historical events by weaponizing Hindu nationalist self-emasculation and conspiratorial fears of love jihad in order to portray all Kashmiri Muslims as being perverted sexual predators out to convert, seduce and prey upon Hindu women. Throughout the film, we repeatedly hear ordinary Muslims, not just the insurgents, shouting, Kashmir will become Pakistan, without Hindu men, but with Hindu women. This also manifests itself within interactions between characters as well. At one point in the film, Krishna and Shiva's mother, Sharada Pandit, questions Shiva's teacher about his school's syllabus. In an almost comical fashion, Rather than answering her question, the red-bearded Muslim Mulvi begins lecherously flirting with her, 
at encouraging her to marry him. This film is not interested in bringing to light sexual violence against Kashmiri Pandit women. It is purely invested in presenting all Muslims as being lustful sexual marauders. As noted by sociology professor Dr. Evian Leidig, the aforementioned prevalent Hindutva conspiracy theory of love jihad is rooted in Orientalist portrayals of Muslims as barbaric and hypersexual. It carries paternalistic and hyper-patriarchal notions based on the assumption that Hindu women are possessions of men, whose purity is defiled as an equivalent to territorial conquest, and hence need to be controlled and protected from Muslims, regardless of consent. Legislation against the perpetrated conspiracy has been institutionalized by the current ruling Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party and implemented in the country's most populous state of Uttar Pradesh by its chief minister, where it has been used as a means of state repression on Muslims and crackdown on interfaith marriages. Muskan Jahan, at the time three months pregnant, was the first woman detained under the new ordinance. She was sent to a quote-unquote protection home after her Muslim husband was arrested under the law, where she suffered a miscarriage allegedly due to negligence by authorities. The BJP's popularization of the prevalent propagandistic perception of Muslims as sexual predators is thus not actually about upholding the dignity of women, but maintaining control over them and clamping down on voluntary interfaith marriages. On a side note, Director Vivek Agnihotri's weaponization of this resonant right-wing trope of presenting women in a dehumanizing manner is unsurprising, particularly given his own views and history regarding the subject. For example, in 2018 he was forced to delete an abusive tweet made towards Indian actress Swara Bashkar, where he accused her of being a prostitute for supporting an alleged rape victim. The same year, fellow actress Tanushri Dutta recalled how Agnihotri once requested that she unclothe herself and dance for a scene that she wasn't even in. Thankfully, fellow actors present at the time, such as the late Irfan Khan, stepped in to defend her. This depiction of Muslims as violent, perverted criminals must therefore be contextualized within the Indian government's current policies towards this demographic. The BJP often uses Muslims as the electoral boogeyman to consolidate a culturally diverse and caste-riven Hindu vote base against a common other. It makes sense to bang on about collective Muslim extremism as a means of Hindu mobilization. For example, on the last day of 2021, a leading national daily ran an overtly Islamophobic propaganda ad showing the duality of a Muslim throwing a Molotov cocktail and then deceitfully seeking governmental pardon in the following frame. This advert was funded by the aforementioned BJP government of Uttar Pradesh. Just a few weeks earlier, several far-right Hindu leaders openly called for the genocide against Muslims at a three-day religious summit held in northern India's Haridwar city. In 2017, Reuters reported that in the past seven years, 97% of violence against Muslims occurred after the 2014 election, which saw the BJP come to power across the country. In addition, research by Rahil Datawala and Michael Biggs has shown that anti-Muslim attacks were far higher in areas where the BJP faced stiff electoral opposition than in places where it is already strong. Far-right BJP officials often claim that the higher the number of Muslims within a constituency, the higher the chances of centrist parties coming to power by acquiescing to minority groups' requests. Thus, encouraging the perception of these areas' Muslim minorities as an existential demographic threat that must not be appeased. Nationalists, rather than dealing with lower-class demands for greater economic opportunity, instead marginalize Muslims as not being fully Indian and portray those who carry out attacks against them as heroes that defend the majority from the perceived anti-nationals. As a result, anti-Muslim violence is planned and executed to render Muslims economically and socially crippled, and, 
as a final outcome of that economic and social backwardness, assimilating them into the lower rungs of Indian society. Presenting entire populations of people as collectively sharing certain negative traits is certainly not a novel propaganda tool. Similar to the Uttar Pradesh propaganda ad we mentioned earlier, Nazi Germany was notorious for producing films about the duality of Jewish people such as The Eternal Jew, depicting them on the one hand as being uncivilized, depraved and parasitic within their own communities before supposedly changing their external appearance to seem more civilized and European-like when interacting with Germans. This had the effect of normalizing their perception as subhuman and untrustworthy, thus legitimizing state violence against them during what became the Holocaust. A frequent technique employed throughout the film is the juxtaposition of graphic violence against Kashmiri pandits alongside journalists, activists and university professors calling for Kashmiri independence and voicing opposition to Indian army and government war crimes within the region. For example, shortly after the first scene in the film which depicts the brutal execution of Krishna's father in his own home, the act immediately transitions to scenes of ordinary Kashmiri Muslims and modern-day university student activists calling for azadi, freedom. This is done in order to ensure that the audience associates the former with the latter. Azadi is by far the single most repeated word in the script. When the audience hears words like Azadi, director Agnihotri wants them to associate this with the slaughter of Kashmiri pandits. Thus, to call for Kashmiri freedom or condemn Indian war crimes is presented as being mutually inclusive with the brutal murder of Hindus in the region. Again, this is not a one-off incident. The film also repeatedly has insurgents murder innocent people and then chant Azadi over and over again to reinforce this impression. This technique is extended to other areas as well. For example, when Krishna, Shiva and their mother Sharda first escape the Kashmir Valley on the back of a truck, the audience is pleasantly treated to the camera panning over rows of frost-bitten Kashmiri pandit corpses hanging from forest trees. The director then has the film transition to a completely different scene of a TV journalist talking about the injustices Muslims have historically suffered under Hindu rule. Listening to what the journalist says, very little of what he raises is factually incorrect. Despite its Muslim majority, British-appointed Dogra rule was overwhelmingly Hindu-dominated. As noted by Professor John L. Esposito, the Muslim majority suffered under the high taxes of the administration and generally had few opportunities for growth and advancement. This continued into the era of statehood under India, where Muslims possessed little opportunity for economic advancement or civil rights. However, because this is shown immediately after rows of Hindu corpses, director Agnihotri is able to effectively refute the points raised by the journalist without rationally engaging them. Remember, propaganda is not supposed to rationally convince you, but rather it is designed to evoke an emotional response from you in favor of the film's thesis. After all, if you encountered corpses of innocent Hindus, and then somebody began talking about the oppression of Muslims by Hindus, you would rightly be infuriated. But you aren't supposed to realize this when watching the film. The film's target audience is not supposed to mentally separate these two. This is why many movie critics noted that the film's sudden transitions between the past and the present were abrupt, irregular, and seemingly random making it difficult to distinguish when and where on the timeline each scene is taking place. However, when viewing the movie through the lens of it attempting to implore its audience to associate particular events with certain political slogans, it becomes increasingly clear why the film is structured in such a seemingly haphazard manner. Director Agnihotri consciously uses these juxtapositions to draw a direct link between the tragic suffering of Kashmiri pundits 
and modern-day criticism of the Indian government's actions in Kashmir itself. This also gives us the opportunity to touch on how the film engages with educational institutions and journalism as a whole. We mentioned earlier that the film's secondary antagonist is Krishna's modern-day university professor, Radhika Menon. Putting aside the fact that she is a poorly disguised parody of Professor Nivetita Menon of Jawaharlal Nehru University, the film provides us with great insight into the Indian government's attitude towards intellectual and journalistic defiance. In 2016, students of JNU organised a protest in support of the struggle of Kashmiri people for their democratic right to self-determination. Following the event, the JNU Students' Union president along with two other students were arrested by the Delhi police and charged with sedition. Now of course, the film doesn't show the latter, but immediately following its depiction of the brutal violence against Kashmiri Hindus, it does take the liberty of jumping to a segment of Professor Menon's speech condemning the transgressions of Indian occupation forces in Kashmir. She addresses the students at JNU with arousing words and verses of freedom and hope for justice and is curiously depicted in a photograph with Farooq Malik Bitta, in the exact same post that activist Arun Dhati Roy was pictured with Yasin Malik, another JKLF leader who was hunted by India as a terrorist and later when he renounced violence and vowed peace, he was refused negotiations by India and Pakistan and is currently in an Indian prison. By having Professor Menon publicly bully our main character Krishna when he brings up atrocities committed against Kashmiri Hindus, the film is once again able to dismiss and villainize every word that she says, even if they may be true. When she points out that over 7,000 Kashmiri Muslims are missing, several thousand more are dead, or how Kashmir is still awaiting the plebiscite recommended by the United Nations, the film essentially mocks these points by having her say them immediately after depicting the earlier violence suffered by Kashmiri Hindus. Likewise, when she corrects Krishna that it was not several thousand Kashmiri pandits who were killed, but less than a few hundred, the audience is encouraged to view this as a case of conspiratorial genocide denial. In spite of the fact, that these figures are supported by the Indian government themselves. This has the effect of reinforcing the film's hierarchy of suffering. Rather than the murder of innocent pandits being presented as part of the government-escalated insurgency, which saw both Kashmiri Muslims and Hindus suffer, director Agnihotri reminds the audience that these are mutually exclusive. The legitimate criticism of the Indian government's excesses against Kashmiri Muslims is tantamount to a denial of the suffering of Hindus, and thus they cannot exist. It is no surprise then therefore that someone like Prime Minister Modi would have a vested interest in the promotion of this film. After all, if one can present criticism of his policies and denial of pandit genocide as being mutually inclusive, then it would be far easier to appeal to right-wing populism across the country and garner more and more support for his policies in Kashmir. One of the hallmarks of a staunchly authoritarian government is how every microcosm of society is inexorably tied to the political. Every part of the nation is a battleground between the state and its political enemies attempting to sabotage and provoke sedition. Even the smallest issue of student council elections must be presented as being inseparable from the wider political battle that the dominant party of the nation is engaged in. The fusion of student politics with national politics manifests itself by intricately tying Krishna's aspirations to be a student council representative with the fact that he is a Kashmiri pandit and thus supposedly unable to relate with the other pupils who in this film are apparently all Muslim, despite being a minority across the country. To address this issue, Professor Menon encourages Krishna to revolve his council campaign around villainizing the current Indian government by constructing them as the archetypal antagonist for his story. When Krishna points out to the professor that this is extortion, she retorts by saying, this is mere politics. Now, we don't really need to analyze this plot point, 
it's fairly obvious that the writers are taking a dig at all of the quote-unquote slimy academics and professors who criticise the Indian government. But when I initially saw this scene, I was convinced that it was a case of the film being utterly ignorant towards its own narrative. The first 30 minutes of this film had done nothing but craft a single archetypal villainous caricature of Kashmiri Muslims. Yet director Agnihotri has the audacity to lecture the audience about extortionately villainising the Indian government? In essence, how can the film condemn something that it has consistently sought to do itself? However, upon closer inspection, it is clear that the graphic violence shown at the start of the film serves to absolve the writers and director of engaging in the artificial villainization it accuses others of. What do we mean by this? Well, because the antagonistic nature of Kashmiri Muslims is axiomatically presented as their default state throughout the film, it is now impossible for the writers to artificially construct them as such. By depicting Kashmiri Muslims as violent sexual predators all throughout the movie, it cannot be accused of unfairly villainizing them. Because unlike the Indian government, that's just what Muslims are. That's their fundamental nature. All Muslims are terrorists, and all terrorists are Muslim. A resonant trope that the film repeatedly plays on is a fanatical obsession with a plot. Every time information is revealed to our protagonist Krishna, the audience is explicitly informed, either visually or through the film's dialogue, that this is evidence that the media has suppressed. It tells the viewer repeatedly that the Kashmiri Hindus were not merely victims of a genocide, but rather they were victims of a genocide who were actively silenced covered up and ignored when they tried to speak out. The most egregious example of this is towards the penultimate act, where Krishna actually meets our antagonist, Farooq Malik Bitta, who tells him that the famous aforementioned Nadimag massacre was actually carried out by the Indian army. Obviously, this is absurd. It is extensively known and documented that the shooting was conducted by terrorists disguised as Indian soldiers terrorists that were swiftly gunned down by Indian police less than a week after the massacre. Nevertheless, the film has a confused and rattled Krishna return to Brahma Dutt and accuse the Kashmiri pandits of lying to him. In turn, Dutt finally provides him with a set of files titled Kashmiri Politics, Kashmiri Killings and Kashmiri Genocide. Both Krishna and the audience are told that within these files rest the true facts about the Kashmiri Pandits, suppressed from Krishna and the outside world, but finally coming to light. As this climactic scene goes on, the camera meticulously switches back and forth between Krishna's horrified expressions and the contents of the files, taking its time to slowly pan over the images and writings contained therein. Reinforcing Krishna's naive and traumatised perspective as the lens through which the audience is supposed to have these events revealed to them. There's just one small problem with this narrative. The files are composed of actual newspaper clippings. You can't claim that the media and news outlets have been lying to Kashmiri pandits and the Indian people about the Nadimag massacre whilst relying on extracts from these exact newspaper prints to tell the truth about them, many of which being famous and widely read Kashmiri papers. And this is where the film's narrative collapses under the weight of its own internal contradictions. On the one hand, director Agnihotri presents us with newspaper articles from 2003 headlining tragedies like the Nadimag massacre. And then, in the same act, we are told that this was suppressed by the media, and shown the event being carried out by the secular JKLF in the 1990s. It just doesn't make any sense. But that's the thing. It isn't supposed to make sense. The audience is not meant to think too deeply about these contradictions and are instead supposed to uncritically accept the presented narrative. During the final act of the Kashmir Files, 
Our protagonist gifts the audience with an extended monologue as part of his campaign for the student elections. What makes this monologue so tragic is that it actually starts off well. Krishna introduces the speech by providing the audience with insight into the history of the Kashmiri Pandit people, and the hundreds if not thousands of years that they have lived in the region. He tells us about their accomplishments and contributions to the fields of science, mathematics and philosophy. Granted, parts of his account are exaggerated and romanticised for effect, but nonetheless it gives the audience a taste of how pandits might see their own history, culture and ancestral connection to the land of Kashmir. The first few sentences therefore truly are a breath of fresh air in this film. However, director Agnihotri is quick to remind us once again that this is not a film about Kashmiri pandits. Rather, this is about the weaponization of Kashmiri pandit history and suffering to delegitimize the Indian state's internal and external enemies. Eerily reminiscent of chief propagandist Joseph Goebbels' diatribes levied against the so-called Lugan press, Krishna diverts the subject of his speech away from the pandits and begins comically hurling accusations of disloyalty and the de facto harbouring of sympathies for the terrorists that murdered Kashmiri Hindus. Echoing all too familiar Hindu nationalist talking points about how the historical tyranny by Muslim rulers and dervish orders has been covered up by mainstream history books. But remember, this abrupt change is not a flaw. Rather, it is part of the narrative. This final sermon, situated carefully within the last 15 minutes of the film, is designed to encapsulate our protagonist's now completed character arc. No longer is he the naive and malleable soul that we first encountered at the start of the film. Rather, he has now transformed into a passionate advocate of the nation-state in the war against its internal enemies, the media and intelligentsia. He is exactly what the film wants him to be, an enlightened counter to the so-called mainstream liberal media and universities who dare criticise and object to the growing tide of Hindutva nationalism. Off the cuff, he begins referencing biographies like Tuhfatul Ahbab, selectively cherry-picking the historical record to present Islam as utterly alien to Kashmir, and owing its existence in the region solely to the forced conversion of Hindus under the sponsorship of saints like Shamsuddin Araki. The fact that Araki was a devotee of the Shia Nurbakhshi order, who had a vested interest in maximising and exaggerating his number of converts to increase his legitimacy, is conveniently glossed over. The film doesn't actually want you to go and read Tahfatul Ahbab, it simply wants the audience to take this example of forced conversion as a microcosm of a continuous, several century long program of persecution and genocide against Kashmiri pandits at the hands of Kashmiri Muslims. We are not meant to recall that Kashmir's transition to the Sultanate period was not from an Islamic invasion as described by our protagonist, but rather as noted by historian Dean Akardi, its first Muslim ruler was a Buddhist prince of Ladakhi origin known as Rinchad, who converted to Islam as a means to quell dissent in his court and shift legitimacy away from the caste status. Director Agnihotri is careful to ensure that the pre-Islamic period of Kashmir is incorrectly described as a communal idyll devoid of the violence that Muslims later brought with them. Such a description is necessary in order to reinforce the narrative that the destruction, unrest and suppression seen throughout Kashmiri history is solely a product of Muslim rule. Remember, like the graphic violence witnessed earlier on in the film, this speech is not a form of propaganda because it focuses on the persecution of Hindus. Rather, it is propagandistic because it weaponizes the persecution of Kashmiri pandits in order to delegitimize the existence of Muslims. The scene fits with the theme of the rest of the film, whereby every description or depiction of Kashmiri pandit experiences 
must be sharply contrasted with a violent generalized caricature of Kashmiri Muslims both in a historical and contemporary sense. Make no mistake, just like the inconsistent characterization of our main cast and the seemingly haphazard jumps in time, these historical errors and generalizations are not there by accident. Rather, they exist specifically to legitimize Hindu nationalist mythology about the existence of Muslims in both Kashmir and India as a whole. It deliberately relies on the average young male Indian audience member being utterly unfamiliar with the subjects that it explores in order to elicit an emotive response in favour of the film's narrative. Remember, the purpose of propaganda is not to rationally convince you of its message. Rather, its purpose is to emotionally persuade the audience through rhetorical and cinematic devices. In his 1995 essay on fascism, cultural theorist Umberto Eco lists 14 general properties of fascist ideology. One of these cornerstones was how such societies rhetorically cast their enemies as, at the same time, too strong and too weak. On the one hand, fascists play up the power of certain disfavoured groups in order to encourage their own followers a sense of grievance and humiliation. On the other hand, fascist leaders point to the decadence and weakness of those groups as proof of their ultimate feebleness in the face of an overwhelming popular will. The masses must feel humiliated by the enemy's vaunted power, but they must also believe that they can, indeed that they will, defeat the enemy. Throughout the Kashmir Files, Kashmiri Muslims are, as a collective monolithic entity, depicted as an existential threat to everybody that they encounter. The previously mentioned portrayal of them as constantly marching, chanting and massacring people in large numbers is frequently juxtaposed with our main characters repeatedly lamenting that if only the Indian government would weaponize its state violence and massive army to comprehensively crush Kashmiri autonomy, then the Kashmir question could be solved in one fell swoop. The chief reason to which the film regularly attributes insurgent violence is to the unwillingness of Kashmir's chief minister and the Indian government to employ its state troops to their full effect against the insurrection. This is accompanied by the repeated insistence that Article 370 of the Indian Constitution is the primary reason for this occurring, and for the inability of Kashmiri Pandit refugees to return there even going so far as to have Krishna's grandfather, Pushkar, dedicate his life after the expulsion to protesting for its revocation. Without going into too much detail, Article 370 was the basis for Jammu and Kashmir's accession to the Republic of India in 1949. The article exempted the Jammu and Kashmir state from the Indian constitution. It allowed the Indian administered region the jurisdiction to make its own laws in all matters except finance, defence, foreign affairs and communication, and prevented people from outside the state from permanently settling in and buying property there. However, in reality, the Indian government regularly uninstalled, reinstalled and imprisoned Kashmiri political leaders and as mentioned, were quite happy to rig elections and deploy state troops whenever they desired. Human rights groups estimate that there is one armed person for every 17 civilians and roughly seven armed personnel to every square kilometre of land in the region. Securing Kashmir's title as one of the world's most densely militarised zones. These numbers stand in stark contrast to India's estimates of perceived militants, which are only in the hundreds. The militarization has spawned a valley rife with human rights abuse. From 2008 to 2018 alone, an estimated 1,081 Kashmiri civilians were eliminated by security forces in extrajudicial executions. Since the start of the pro-freedom uprising in 1989, activists estimate that at least 8,000 Kashmiris have disappeared. These tragedies are compounded by thousands of unknown and unmarked mass graves and incalculable cases of torture and sexual violence. Therefore, the special status that Article 370 provided 
never truly materialized into genuine autonomy. On the 5th of August 2019, a few weeks before the film's announcement, the Parliament of India revoked the special status that Article 370 provided. This was accompanied by the deployment of an additional 35,000 paramilitary forces to the region, the severing of internet and phone services, prevention of assembly and house arrest of chief ministers. Before the August 2019 siege had even begun, Kashmir had been placed in the dark. Similar to the film, this special status was repeatedly touted by government officials as the reason for their supposed inability to repatriate Kashmiri pandit refugees. The issue with this is that the autonomous privileges granted to the state of Kashmir did not prevent the resettlement of refugees. Why? Because the right to return for refugees is guaranteed under international law. It is not the same as non-Kashmiri citizens buying up property within the state's borders and settling there. This is why Article 370 did not prevent the resettlement of returning Kashmiri Muslim refugees who fled during the massacres of 1947. The Kashmiri Pandit refugees were therefore unable to return to the Kashmir Valley for one reason and one reason alone. The Indian government chose not to help them not because of Kashmiri Muslims, not because of Article 370. In addition to abrogating the article, the BJP also transformed Jammu and Kashmir from a state into a union territory, directly ruled by the government and revoking many of its own constitutional laws. While screams and opposition rang through the chambers of parliament, the deathly silence in Kashmir was stifling. The entire map of Kashmir had changed without its people even knowing. The August 5th abrogation has also paved the way for exploitative resource extraction in the region. As discussed in further detail within the Harvard Law Review, Kashmir's special status previously ensured that non-local businesses were barred from operating in the region without a lease agreement from the government. But starting in January following the 2019 abrogation, all mining bids were solicited online at a time when internet connectivity was still restricted in Kashmir. The result was a death blow to Kashmiri businesses. For the first time, almost 70% of mineral extraction contracts in Kashmir were procured by non-Kashmiris. The Indian government also introduced a new domicile order that expands the definition for residency and allows a new class of non-Kashmiris to move into the region. This legal manoeuvre mirrored the use of registration by title to facilitate the expropriation of indigenous lands in Palestine and Australia. By giving an expanded class of non-Kashmiris access to new forms of livelihood and land, India has made the settlement of a new class of residents viable and attractive. The abrogation of Article 370 and the laws that have followed it are quintessential settler colonial violence but so too are the legal regimes that came before and after the abrogation. On August 15th, 2019, India would simultaneously celebrate its 73rd Independence Day and forcibly hold Kashmiris under lockdown. What seemed like a sinister irony became the norm. In the seven months that followed, Kashmiris would spend Eid, weddings, medical emergencies and funerals in an eerie blackout. The economic loss, an estimated 2.4 billion, would pale in comparison only to the human one. Kashmiri lives were inundated with reported army-instigated torture of children, sexual violence against women, disappearances of young men, and arbitrary detention of civilians. In the words of Kashmiri scholars Samrin Mushtaq and Modassir Amin, the 5th of August was not a beginning, not a diversion, not a rupture, but the extension of 70 years of mass killings, blinding, torturing, disappearances and rape, all of which advanced the mission to physically and symbolically eliminate the Kashmiri.